literally we were just talking about this a few minutes ago. So I myself may already sound as if I'm uh, not gonna sound, like, like I may not be part of the low carb, high fat community, in that I'm gonna dare to suggest this, that I do think it's possible that high levels of beta hydroxybutyrate in your blood at a certain point may be an indicator that there's just not as much uptake and that just like glucose and triglycerides being high in the blood could in fact be a signal that may not be a positive one. But, but one thing that I constantly have to keep going over, and I'm sure you see this a lot, Marty, with athletes, is low carb athletes start getting frustrated because they had high ketone levels, particularly beta hydroxybutyrate in the beginning, and it precipitously goes down and they're like, I don't understand what's going on, I haven't really changed the diet a lot and so forth. Again, as a systems guy, <laughs> there's no good reason for your body to have more energy parked in your bloodstream than is necessary. It's gonna keep working with what the appropriate and most efficient amount is. That, that space is very scarce and important. Your, your vascular system needs to only move around what it absolutely needs to move around. Your body's surprisingly good about monitoring and regulating against it. So if you feel great, I don't think it actually matters that much what number you're gonna see on that meter. But then that kind of applies to other things like cholesterol, so. Yeah, next question. So my question is probably for Leah and Jackie. I just wondered about snacks for little kids. I've got a one-year-old and a four-year-old. Kinder snacks, obviously you can't take nuts. It's the sort of thing that I give them at home, but just what uh, snack ideas you give your children. You can, oh, am I on? You can take crickets, cricket protein. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, <laughs> I normally give my kids um, like just boiled egg, veggie sticks, um, yeah, they, my kids don't tend to snack a lot either. Like I notice when other kids come over, because they're eating a nutrient dense breakfast, lunch and dinner, they kind of don't tend to snack as often in between. Um, but when they do, it's usually, yeah, some kind of finger food, like yeah, an egg or a boiled egg. Um, I make little mini omelets for them. I've got, um, somehow along the lines, we just ended up with this little mini Breville omelet maker. So you can just throw a couple of eggs in there and some ham and cheese, and it makes it a uh, perfect omelette size that fits into your lunchbox. Um, and then we the kids just eat that. Um, yeah, do you have some other? Because you've got the more to baby and toddler. Yeah. yeah. Similar to your uh, age group. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's tough with daycare because all the allergies and the nut-free and then now daycare is egg-free as well. And so, yeah, it's tricky. So, um, and my three-year-old is extremely picky. So, yeah, you just got to try your best. And, uh, you know, I send her along with Baby Bell cheeses. She likes those. Um, I try and, you know, chop some veggies up sometimes. She doesn't really like those. But just the usual things, yogurt. I'm not very imaginative, I must say. So, but I try my best. <laughs> yeah, we, we do uh, yogurt, Greek yogurt, and then we just put a f some fresh berries on top of that for them, rather than giving them the packet ones or the you know the ones high in sugar. Uh, we also do um, smoothies. So, like you know, we might make a coconut milk based one instead of an almond milk based smoothie, and then put that in a little kind of portable drink container type thing or in one of those squeeze pouches that you can buy. Yeah, and fill those up, so. You can also use lettuce. Lettuce, yeah. yeah. Do a veggie roll. Yeah, yeah, veggie rolls with lettuce, yeah. And, and I, I think one thing, 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 there are a lot of lettuce. different forums you can get onto, so I mean, it's always worthwhile just seeing what other people's experience is and just trying stuff. You know, if, if you offer it and they don't like it, you can always try something else. So um, never be, you know, never be afraid to do your own sort of experiments. I think. Yeah. And um, keep introducing it as well. I find because often the first ten times it'll be like no, and then suddenly my three-year-old will surprise me and eat it. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Good. Um, look, it's amazing what people start eating at, at at any age. I probably I shouldn't. It is being recorded, and I better not say it. Um, <laughs> about a certain person who's very close to me would never touch kimchi and suddenly now eats it every day. Um, but I won't give any names or anything like that. Uh, yeah, next question. Uh, first of all, Joe, a, a comment and then a question. Uh, thank you for trying to organise that group for doctors. I think there have been talks about doctor groups quite a bit, and I think we have an overlap. Uh, there is also potentially a group that... Peter had asked to meet, this is of young doctors here today who want to get up to speed but feel they don't know enough. 
uh, whereas the group that you want to form sounds like doctors already in it wanting to be louder. Uh, and so I'm just wondering whether or not there could be a meeting of groups. But certainly um, for those young doctors here who are registrars who think they want to come up to speed, uh, Peter was hoping that we could meet uh, after lunch or, you know, half, We're talking about the same thing, Peter and is I. It? Yeah. In, that, in that case, there's also this educational function that you might have to add to it. So uh, for all doctors, not just those who want to advance a course. Now, um, question about fuel. I understand that you're talking about the supply of fuel in the blood, but what about the utilisation within the cells or the inefficiencies? So we're looking at mitochondrial function here and how um, one of our favourite drugs that we love to bag, and it does absolutely knock your CoQ10 to bits. Um, and the fact that uh, one of the richest sources of CoQ10 is actually in your organ meats, particularly hearts, where do we get this stuff from? I mean, uh, clearly one of the ways of dealing with the energy is to use it efficiently as well. So some comments about, um, um, about CoQ10 and where you get it from. Uh, yeah, actually that was... <laughs> I have to tell you that a lot of what gave me a um, very different opinion about uh, LDL cholesterol being bad for us was statins themselves. Uh, and I'll, this kind of ties into the question in a moment, and that's because the existing statin research, statins are actually extremely successful at bringing down your LDL. Absolutely. They're surprisingly not proportionally the same in bringing down your risk for cardiovascular disease. Yet, yet you have these other functional effects that happen, such as, um, correct, the sudden need for having on CoQ10 because there's clearly some level of uh, cellular impact that comes along with robbing the body of these LDL particles and the LDLC in order to meet this kind of scorecarding um, effect that we want to look at. I mean, a lot of people don't, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but one of the other things that are part of low-density lipoproteins are fat-soluble vitamins, uh, A, D, E, and K. I mean, these are, these are things that come in the same boat that, and, and not having not the cells not having that level of access to those nutrients could have a lot of these side effects that are intracellular and it's it, uh, the problem is is that I don't think that it's very easy to acquire the research on that to determine what the long-term deleterious effects are and unfortunately in looking through a lot of these uh, trials like Mr. Fit and Jupiter and a lot of the shenanigans that took place I don't know that I can truly trust a lot of what the study's outcomes are particularly in the case of things like all-cause mortality and that's why I tell everybody Please don't bring me any studies, again, that don't include all-cause mortality. And I use my cyanide diet as an example because a lot of people in the control group for the cyanide diet may die of normal causes. But hey, those people who are in the intervention group with the cyanide diet, why well, their risk of cardiovascular disease dropped to nearly none. And their risk for Alzheimer's disease dropped to nearly none. Why? Because they all died the next day. <laughs> So if something kills you sooner, it necessarily means it won't kill you by other means later. So if you want to reduce your chance for cardiovascular disease, go rock climbing without safety equipment, and I promise your chances will lower <laughs> that you're going to die of a heart attack. All right. Um, I'll keep that one in mind. How to reduce your risk factors. That's really good. Um, have we got any other uh, questions? But, okay, look, in that case, two things to wind up. Number one, all-cause all mortality is really, really important because I was quite staggered to read a few years ago, I think it was in the New York Times, a survey that suggested that the cause of death on death certificates in America was estimated to be probably about 50% accurate. Um, and that's not because anybody wants to get it wrong, but because often when you're asked to write a death certificate, you really are making a best guess. Unless there's an autopsy done, it's an assumption, but it is just that. But all-cause mortality means it doesn't matter what you've died of, you're still dead, and it's difficult to fudge that. So it is the most useful, um, it is the most useful outcome to measure, and hopefully it's a bit further away and we don't meet sort of sticky... Our engineers, engineers love it because it's a one or a zero. Yeah. It's, yep. it, the easiest thing to diagnose is being alive. Yeah, it's a bit like the uh, on-off switch. So, look, thank you very much for your uh, attendance this morning. I'll, I'll do a David and say first to comment. Um, 
uh, of the people I've analysed, 70 people or so, um, probably aligns with what you were saying, that, that half of the people that I've analysed lie between about 1.5 grams per kilogram of lean body mass and about 2.5, so there is that range. Um, I've done Ted Naiman and Louis Villensenor doing protein spring modified fasts, and they're sitting about 2.4. Um, I suppose my question is um, the protein leverage hypothesis paper from Sydney, which you're probably aware of, Richard, mentions that diabetics potentially need more protein rather than less because they're leaching some to gluconeogenesis and they have a, a, an anabolic resistance because of the insulin resistance. Be interested in your comment on that. So one of the things that a, that a recently ketogenic diabetic has is uh, a lot of body fat that's, uh, that's spilling over and being metabolised. And so they're, 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 uh, uh, they've, they have a lot of glycogen coming back, returned to, to, as a substrate. So they may actually not have as high a requirement as that paper said for uh, protein as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. Um, uh, the other thing is that um, uh, I didn't really follow uh, uh, the, pro the I, I, I agree that the, that the protein leverage hy hypothesis has got some legs and it's worth testing um, but the uh, my experience when I got to protein deficit where I made a mistake in my calculations and I, I went too low um, my experience was there were really strong signals that happened um, and I wasn't being, I wasn't craving a, uh, a, um, a, nu a nutrient for which I don't have a sensor and substituting protein instead. I was actually physically craving umami flavours, which I speculate is a protein signal. So, and, and there's recent studies about protein signals in the brain uh, that, uh, um, that will, may, be the, may be the cause of that. I think appetite is also a good indicator for energy levels as well. And so some people who have um, a deranged um, uh, mechanism for dealing with energy um, have, uh, have signals that don't work, work well. I, I know when I, that first photo, I was about 149 kilograms, uh, and my homeostasis was keeping me there. So my appetite was keeping me at that point. And I was, at that point, uh, I would fill the capacity of my stomach and still be hungry and have to wait for it to, to and, and so that, that was a derangement and that was just, that's just a, a, you know, a metabolism that was deranging in its environment. And then as soon as I got carbs out of it, my homeostasis basically shot me down to about 104.9 from 149. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 a lot of the derangements all went away, so. Hello, so <laughs> Richard. Naturally, a very common question that will come up in response to your talk is uh, what a lot of the different camps will debate about, and it's whether or not um, gluconeogenesis is demand-driven or supply-driven. So a lot of people will say, for example, if you have too much protein, it will get converted into glucose, and because it will get converted into glucose, it will take you out of uh, ketosis, and you'll also spike your sugar, et cetera, and it's... Uh, a lot of people would say it's dose dependent and so forth. Could you maybe unpack that a little bit? Yeah, if that was the case, then if overeating protein would result in hyperglycemia, um, which it doesn't. So uh, I mean that the uh, we make uh, we make uh, we make glucose when we have a, a hole in our glycogen, um, and we make uh, we make uh, we fill our glycogen with new glucose when we make uh, when we produce glucagon. Um, so it's um, so, so there is a, it is a demand-driven system, but uh, eating protein can actually change the demand. So, for example, if I uh, eat uh, a, a protein that has that that, that is uh, uh, that uh, makes aspartate and that repletes my oxaloacetate, I now have fewer ketones. I now have a brain that requires a little more, bit more glucose. It dips further into the into the blood supply of glucose. Glucose goes down, and now. My body, my liver naturally responds by saying, "Hey, glucose went down. Let's make more." So, so, you know, the, the, the question is really the question is really that that not is it demand driven or is it supply driven, but how does the homeostasis work? 
My questions for Feng Yuan, just uh, regarding your, thank you for sharing the story of your, your partner, and I was quite amazed at the resolution of the Crohn's disease. Um, a lot of people on keto find that their gut systems get, they get their gut gets better, uh, their bowel sy symptoms uh, disappear. Um, I was wondering, you took uh, your partner off uh, lactose or, or, or dairy products as well. I was wondering whether you think the mechanism was because you've put them on a low FODMAPs and low gluten diet and, and that's therefore no longer stuff, stuffing up his microbiome, mm. or whether it's the anti-inflammatory effect of a keto diet. I mean, we did, to start with, we've done all of the above. So in terms of the actual mechanism, it's really hard to decipher. Um, we put him on to a low FODMAP. Uh, we took him off grains, sugars and dairy. And we also obviously started him on a ketogenic diet. So there would definitely be elements of the anti-inflammatory effects. But one thing was really interesting, um, and, and it's easy to say, okay, the gut microbiome healed and you know the lack of the high FODMAP foods was helping. But one thing that was really interesting was he got to a point where he was feeling really, really good and he actually started eating too much of this thing that we were making at the time called keto mousse. So it was like a chocolate mousse, um, but it was made with cream cheese and he was eating that. And it was through that that he started to notice a few more niggles. And as soon as we got rid of that, his niggles went away. So, I mean, with that, again, the debate could be, is it because cream cheese has more lactose and it was a lactose effect? Or was it the fact that dairy um, triggered the inflammation? And for the symptoms that he was experiencing, it wasn't diarrhea, it wasn't your typical um, lactose intolerance symptoms, and it was more of the inflammatory, the hardening of the sort of gut um, and the pain, so and the throbbing that he was describing. So to me, that was the ketogenic uh, journey for him was definitely more from a anti-inflammatory perspective, but we can't ignore the benefits of the gut microbiome that it had as well. Uh, dummy's question, if I may, to uh, Richard. You referred to body weight and lean body mass and that you've made yeah. an error. Can you I please did. explain the difference? Yeah, sure. Because I thought it was meant to be lean body and you've implied the other. Yeah, and I, I've always used lean body mass because it's it's a like-for-like -like comparison, so it doesn't matter if somebody is... 30% body fat or 10% body fat, their need for protein is is based on their lean body mass. And so I've always used, I, I tend to do that with things like, uh, kilocalories is another example. Anywhere that there's an ambiguity, I try to, to nail it as well as I can. Uh, but it turns out that the uh, the RDI and that Rand et al study uh, were both based on body weight. And the in fact, the Rand et al study and the, the Australian Nutrient Reference Values both called out the fact and said we really should be using lean body mass because it's a better like-for-like -like comparison. So, um, yeah, it, my problem was that, that I was assuming that the, the data was lean body mass because that's what I always use, I always, I always go for. So, um, and so I, I, short, I short-changed myself and uh, I could have been in trouble. But as it was, you know, it was an insignificant amount, so... <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to come back to the, exactly the same question about uh, uh, predicting uh, protein requirement based on either body weight, lean body weight, or ideal body weight. And at a community level, if you're basing on ideal body weight, of course you've got to have some means of calculating, oh sorry, lean body weight, of calculating how much fat have I got and how much muscle I got. And so is there a potential to calculate or estimate protein requirements based upon height? Because, of course, uh, ideal body weight is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, height comes into it. So could we use height to, you know, for males, females, uh, infants or uh, adults to predict uh, protein requirement? I have an answer for that. Go for it. <laughs> So uh, I actually have an answer for that. The, the, the height is used in the BMI calculations. Yeah. And, and the reason that that was done was it, it, it harkens back to the, 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 I think it was called the Quetelet scale, and it was uh, invented by an, a Belgian astrophysicist who was tasked with trying to find in historical data uh, a, a correlation between obesity and disease. And this was like in the 1800s. It was 
it was, uh, and, and the only information that he had in the background of these people, he, you know, he had their genders, he had their occupation, he had how many siblings they had, he had their weight, he had their height. What he was trying to come up with was what was their girth. And so he basically said, well, you know, if we can assume that people are roughly rect uh, roughly, um, uh, roughly spherical and or oblong and they're all of equal density, then we can make the assumption. And so that's where the BMI came out. Now, my BMI for my height, uh, 178 centimetres tall, my BMI for ideal weight would be between 59 kilograms and 79 kilograms. And as you can see from my lean body mass, my lean body mass is 80.38. So I would actually, even if I could magically become 0% body fat, I would still be one and a half kilos overweight. So that, that's an example. Height is not a good predictor of, of adiposity. Um, so uh, I, there, there are, there are um, girth is probably the best, and, and girth, girth over height is, 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 is one of the better ones. Another one that you can use is uh, you can use the circumference of the wrist to determine roughly what type of, what shape somebody is, and then there are calculations to, to use that and the length of the forearm and other things. But there, there really is no, there's no better way than getting a DEXA or you know getting uh, immersed in water and, and, and <laughs> doing you know doing it that way underwater weighing um, and in fact even even the impedance scales do a reasonable job of getting a good a good guess but, but you're right for the general public it's got to be body weight because that's what they know um, but but you know if, if for practitioners I would say you know an impedance scale is probably going to be the best. Mm. I mean, I'm just going to add to that a little bit as well. I think it really comes down to, you know, it is a bit of an imprecise science as well at the moment. So it really comes down to, like I said in my presentation, you know, there's so many different factors we've got to take into consideration. Um, and if you take into consideration someone's physical health, someone's um, physical activity levels, if someone's goals are to, you know, gain muscle mass, etc., then using height, it, you don't really capture all of that as well. So I think purely using one marker like that is going to potentially get a lot more error Whereas even if you do go by the, the 1 to 1.5 grams as an estimate to begin with and adjust it up or down according to whether, you know, we're heading towards the goal or if we're not heading towards the goal sufficiently um, and, and take a few times with it, that would be the best way short of actually getting a true measurement like a DEXA um, or using the bioelectrical impedance. So, yeah, again, height definitely from a practical sense won't work. Sorry, my question again for uh, Feng Yu. And just as a keto dietitian, I'd be interested in uh, whether you commonly uh, see weight loss stalls due to uh, clients' use of uh, sugar alcohols, especially maltitol, which I understand converts 50% into glucose anyway. We typically don't recommend people have foods with a lot of artificial or even natural um, sugar alcohol sweeteners. So the only sweetener that we typically say, you know, if you want to use a little bit of is some stevia. And otherwise, it's really focusing on the whole foods. And we do get people a lot um, where, you know, they get really gung-ho about keto and they come in and they go, oh, I've got my keto bars and I've got my keto this, my keto that. And at the end of the day, it completely detracts from what we're trying to do and really Really, it's no different to anyone else um, who's on a, you know, protein shake based diet or a bars based diet. We're trying to completely move away from that. So in, in saying that, I mean, in terms of from a stall's perspective, even when sugar alcohols are not involved, we do still have people who do stall. And that's when we've got to then recalculate and reassess, you know, are you consuming perhaps too much fat? If you've lost a lot of weight, perhaps we need to readjust protein and things like that as well. I'd actually make just a comment about stalls. With type two diabetics recently gone ketogenic, um, they it's it's traditional for them to to lose a lot of weight rapidly at a very smart clip, and then all of a sudden hit a brick wall and uh, go no further, f and and then slowly edge down from there. And I suspect, and I, I I have no proof of this, but I have suspect that part of the reason is that their adipose tissue is insulin resistant. It's no longer accepting new uh, uh, offers for for new for new storage of energy, and so it's overflowing that. So their 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 blood supply is, is full of energy 
full of glue. Yeah, Dave is nodding like, like a madman in the front row here. Uh, so, so they're overflowing in uh, free fatty acids and they're unable to use them because the, because the insulin is so high, it prevents them from getting long chain fatty acids into their mitochondria for use. So, so, it's, so it's, it's energy wasted in storage. And then as soon as you bring their insulin down low enough that, uh, that, that they, the palmitate shuttle can get that, those long chain a, uh, fatty acids into the mitochondria to be burned, um, then uh, all of a sudden they have lots and lots of energy. And most of the fat, most of the weight loss for those people, and I count myself among those, most of the weight loss for them is uh, not so much uh, reduced appetite, although that, that is the case, it's being able to finally use your energy. So, and, and then, so the point where you store, where you hit the hard store point, is actually, well, I suspect, is your adipose tissue becoming insulin sensitive and saying, okay, when insulin is high, we will now accept uh, storage of, 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 uh, of, adip of, of fat. So, you know, that's, uh, it, Dave's still, now he's glaring at me. <laughs> So okay. the question is, how do you change an insulin? And, and that's a good question, but uh, nobody knows, really. Um, it, 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 <laughs> the diet. <laughs> yeah, so, so Dave said... Yeah. So, yeah. so, the, so the thing is that... that um, no, that's okay. Yeah. So the question was really, how do, you, how, do you, how do you lower insulin? There is a point below which type 2 diabetics new, recently become ketogenic. They're, they're going to hit their fasting insulin. And my fasting insulin a year ago when I started, I didn't even know to measure these, this up until a year ago. And my, my fasting insulin when I measured it a year ago was 39. And it should be around about four. And so that was the point where my, 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 my fat was actually, it had actually become healthy. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's taking in en energy under the instruction of insulin. It's just that my insulin was high. It was no longer being he held aloft in the air by adipose tissue insulin resistance. It was being held aloft by my liver, my hypothalamus, and my pancreas insulin resistance. And so, so, so for those, um, time heals. But, it's, but you know, the, the, the precipitous drop until you hit that stall is a lot different from the gradual decline from that point onwards, and people get upset and say, well, I lost so quickly before, why aren't I doing that again now? So. Uh, I work with... Uh Australian women, you know, actually Australian, New Zealand, mainly 40 plus who want to lose weight. And um, if we were to discuss the Australian version of a low carb ketogenic diet, it would have to include the way they self medicate at the end of the day with a glass of wine or two. Uh, there's been no mention to date, and most American <laughs> diet books uh, are written as though alcohol doesn't exist. If you're giving guidelines to Australian women and men, of course, uh, on a low-carb ketogenic diet who say to you, I ain't going to give up that glass of wine. What would you say? <laughs> I'll say that's fine. Um, <laughs> no, look, I think it really comes down to a lot of people do. They, they do go home at the end of the day and they self-medicate. And that's probably a really good way of describing it. It's, it's self-medication. Um, and at the end of the day, you've got to think, well, why are they doing that? You know, are they doing that because their energy levels are really, really low? Um, are they feeling really irritable, really down, really sad? Is it has it got to do with the stress in their day? Has it got to do with the fact that they've been sleeping poorly or eating poorly? Um, once they start to restore their eating, you start to notice that their want for alcohol starts to go away as well. But when it strictly comes down to it, you know, is alcohol acceptable on a ketogenic diet um, from practical sense, from the day-to-day -day person? Look, ideally, if you're wanting to maintain in ketosis, it's probably not a good idea. However, if you're just doing it for the LCHF lifestyle, um, a glass of wine is okay. And you can definitely find that in wine, especially dry reds and dry whites, the sugar content is actually not super high. Um, so it really comes down to that balance. If having that one glass of wine or a couple of glasses of wine every so often at night is going to be what keeps their sanity and keeps them focused and keeps them going, then that's a good trade-off to eating a whole heap of sugar after dinner. Um, could I have a question as an extension to that? Um, I should say we added alcohol as a fourth food group uh, in our client um, information. <laughs> but my question is that if a relatively small amount of alcohol reduces fat oxidation by 
75, 76%, I think, is, is sort of general consensus. And that, that effect can persist for up to 36 hours. If you're going to then look at, which seemed to be the topic of de jour sort of uh, yesterday, um, look at intermittent fasting, which is really designed to help promote, increase fat oxidation. How do you, as a practitioner, I'm particularly interested, because it's a question I put to my practitioners, because I particularly enjoy a glass of red wine, um, <laughs> how, do you, how do you square that particular circle? So you've got a situation whereby your, your wine intake significantly reduces your ability to utilise fats, and that's and that How belongs. much wine are you drinking? Oh, the, I, th I think the, <laughs> the, the study, the, the, the first study I think was 2002, but the studies that have done over the last 10 years suggest as little as two glasses of wine. Mm. So, so n not as much as I drank last night with Joe, but, um, uh, but you know, a, a, a modest amount, okay. Yeah, look, from a practical level, it really comes down to, again, the question is, why are you intermittent fasting? You know, it comes down to, are you intermittent fasting because you're trying to engage in the metabolic benefits of intermittent fasting? Are you using it as a tool to help weight loss along? Um, are you doing it just because you really enjoy it and you feel more energetic and you feel better? If... It, if a couple of glasses of wine is going to kick you out of burning fat for, well, up to 75% um, efficiency, basically, is what you're saying, then the real compromise there is drop the glass of wine, drop a glass of wine, or um, when you do fast, perhaps engage in more long-term fasting, maybe 24-hour or 36-hour fasting, and during that time and the lead-up to that time, don't drink alcohol. So there's workarounds there, but I think it comes down to, again... I don't want people, especially people who I see, I don't want them to really start thinking about, oh, I have to do intermittent fasting and I have to do ketosis and, and I have to then give up my glasses of wine or oh, how do I do all of this? You know, How do I balance it all and make it all work? The truth is sometimes not everything can work all simultaneously and you've just got to then be able to prioritise and pick and choose what you're really aiming for. And if what you're really aiming for is the, the benefits of fasting, then the alcohol, you do need to drop it back. Uh, so can I just make a, a comment to Luan? Um, firstly, thank you very much for your, your talk. It was uh, excellent. But I'd also like to, uh, to congratulate you because uh, I don't know whether those of you who follow Luan and read her, uh, her blogs, a few weeks ago she came out and basically called out the DAA, who are her uh, governing body, the Dietitians Association. And that's an incredibly courageous thing to do. But, you know, it's, it's one thing for... <laughs> You know, it's one thing for old blokes like me to do it at the end of our careers, and if you know, APRA want to deregister me, well, you know, that's you know, that's okay. But uh, for someone to do it, you know, relatively early on in your in your career, uh, I just really admire that, and, and I think you know, uh, the interesting thing is the DAA didn't respond. Um, you know, maybe the letters in the mail now, but uh, <laughs> you're deregistered. But uh, you know, they've had a fair bit of time. They've had a fair bit of time to uh, to respond, and uh, mm. and I think you know they might be finally getting the fact that uh, there's actually there's the low carb movement is actually too strong for them to to take on. So I admire you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The questions. If not, uh, I think Rod is going to come to make some closing remarks. But um, before he does, I think that we all really need to understand what Rod does for this organisation and the time he puts in to bring us together and bring the speakers over. So this man who works in the day in masquerades as an anaesthetist at night dons his phantom outfits, you know, the ghost who walks. The amazing, the stuff he does. And um, ladies and gentlemen, before he actually does the concluding remarks, can we just thank him for all that he does for us? Uh, it's all those ketones give you the energy. It's good. <laughs> Uh, so, just a few things. Uh, look, it's been great. I mean, I've been organising, doing, associated with some great conferences, and this has got to be absolutely on the highest level. We've just got great speakers, and also we've got a fantastic audience. I mean, our audience is very supportive. They're mostly pretty well down the path of doing this. Uh, and what I find personally in my own life, 
it actually gets better year after year. I get better at doing it and uh, I'm certainly happy with, you know, my energy levels and my thinking, fingers crossed. So, uh, so things coming up. So it's been fantastic and thank you for making it so good. Um, and uh, what else? Yeah, well, we'll keep doing things. Uh, so Sydney, 11th of November. And that's great because that's being organised by an orthopaedic surgeon called Deron Scher. So for once, it's not me organising, it's great. So I'm looking for people out there who are going to step up to the plate and organise things in their own uh, in their own areas, and uh, we've got a great resource of people. Do you see that bunch of doctors clustered around the back end of the room? So this is like really exponentially. I think we've got a good feeling that um, things are uh, things are taking off. And those who like a ski uh, will be um, in Breckenridge in uh, early early March. That is shaping up also to be a cracker of a program. And we've got new stuff, new people, and uh, and very exciting. And also, hopefully, one of the things is we make sure we have a pretty good time as well. Yeah, so uh, the YouTubes uh, will come out from this meeting probably starting in a couple of weeks. And uh, we tend to release them about... We don't want to put them all out at once, and it's really... Of course, I must remember to thank Pete, our cameraman, So Pete takes the videos, he edits the videos, and the quality is fantastic. And Pete also runs our social media, so uh, Low Carb Down Under owes uh, a lot to Pete, as well as Shay Wheeler, who runs, runs our shop, which is fantastic. So uh, yeah, they'll come out bit by bit, and uh, thank you very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you on another occasion. Thank you. Thank you.